Today is Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be back. And uh, boy, you know, I, I have a common thing I often say after being introduced, and it's a lot has happened since I've been on the last time. And uh, now we finally got what I've been expecting for a little while. We got the makings of a gigantic financial crisis. I've been calling this for the last two years, been calling for this. The last two years, Elijah, I call it the systemic layman event. Because after 2008, we did not fix anything. We instead lashed together the big financial institutions like the major banks, lashed them together, tied them together with derivatives to share the risk so that no one would go down. Instead, the risk would be all go down. Uh, this is the year we're going to see some severe risks, if not failures, defaults to sovereign bonds. This is the year we're going to see severe risk, if not failure, for entire national banking systems. And this is the year we're going to see much more installation uh, of, of the various devices and platforms in use with the gold standard. It's, it's, it's starting. We, we're, we're in crisis mode here. Uh, I just love watching the Wall Street floor trader faces when they cover their, their eyes or they cover their head or they cover their mouth or they, they look up like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? I couldn't care less about them. They're some of the biggest scumballs in our society. Uh, they're parasites on the financial structural system. And, and I ask a basic question, Elijah, besides QE, stock buying, which is illicit by the central banks, besides stock buybacks, which are really not exactly illicit, but imprudent and unconventional, not a good idea. Besides QE and stock buybacks, what on earth has justified a stock bull market during a vicious recession. Right. You definitely have a really good point there. And it seems like possibly the bull market is over. We just saw yesterday the worst point decline in history for the Dow. It fell 1,175 points. It's 2,000 points below its all-time high. So what do you think is causing the market to tank? Rising bond yields, global rejection of the dollar, recognition that we're in a vicious recession, tightening by the Fed. I, I warned people six, eight, 10, 12 months ago, if the Fed continues to tighten and tries to achieve some kind of a status of normalcy in monetary policy, they're going to cause one of the biggest market crashes in history. Well, they continue to raise rates. They continue with their absolute rubbish nonsense of a, of a recovery. Oh, my gosh. We still have price inflation. We still have a recession. We still have the clowns running our government. Talking about economic statistics in summary, they're calling all that inflation growth. We don't have any growth. Just look at the jobless figures. It's up near 25 percent. Contrasted with the 5 percent that they claim, and that's nothing more than the percentage of former workers who claim, no, percentage of workers who claim state unemployment insurance. That's not unemployment rate. Unemployment rate is the number of people who don't have a job or able-bodied divided by the total workforce. People collecting unemployment insurance is not the jobless rate. So that's a Robert Rubin, Clinton administration fiction. 
along with his price inflation fiction. One of the biggest stories lately, apart from the financial markets uh, in the economic realm, is uh, shrinkflation. <laughs> no, notice the size of the packaging is going down, but the price stays the same. That's how they're concealing price inflation. And I guarantee you, the US government is not making adjustments on the volumes to record the price inflation as a result. If you drop by half, let me just give a simple example, drop by half the size of a Snicker bar, the price doubles if they don't change the price. The effective price doubles. Okay, so they're reducing the size of, uh, say, uh, fruit drinks, reducing the size of a loaf of bread, and they're not changing the price because they want to maintain the price, maintain the illusion that everything's stable, which, you know, it's not a bad idea for a country suffering from 60% obesity. <clears throat> anyway, it's the rising bond yield that's causing this. It's the global rejection of the dollar. It's the Fed tightening. It's a lot of things coming together. And it's also companies, one by one, revealing their really wretched financial condition, like General Electric, like Wells Fargo, uh, and a few others. And at the same time, the pension funds are, are, are scaring the wits out of the market. Uh, this is a confluence in a shitstorm. And it's overdue. I, I'm not saying, oh, you know, this is great. I'm saying, why on earth did the stock market double in the last couple of years or so during a vicious recession? Stock buybacks, the Fed, plus their Wall Street minions buying stocks. That's not part of the Fed charter. That's a violation of law. When companies don't invest in their company and shove bigger compensation packages for their executives while doing you know, increases in dividends and big stock buybacks, it's heretical. It's very destructive. It's like saying, you know, you know, we're not going to worry about new product lines. We're not going to worry about efficiencies for our, you know, our, our supply chain. We're not going to worry about all that silly stuff like running a business. Let's up our dividend. Let's buy some stock back and let's give ourselves a big raise in the executive group. Okay, this has been going on for two or three years. Well, it's time to stop it. I mean, oh my gosh. The United States is full of pathetic leadership and moronic population that chases the next asset bubble instead of investing in its country. Where's the creation of new businesses? Where's the infrastructure? Where's the cessation of war, endless war, war, war? My gosh, you got a $5 million Pentagon contribution to the National Football League to have honor guards, to have metal veterans at the, at the Super Bowl coin flip. We're becoming a war economy and a, an African-style hyper-monetary inflation financial engineering joke of a country full of fraud oh i love the examples of fraud why if big pharma elijah has gigantic revenue and profits why do they have to promote the american cancer society and and other cancer related charitable funds. 
take a close look at some of these charitable funds and you see that 95% is overhead. So for every dollar you shove into it with a donation, a nickel goes towards some research which they don't need because Big Pharma already has a cancer cure. Okay, everything about the U.S. on the financial front, just about everything, is a fraud. Just about everything. And, and we're seeing it in the stock market. You see lies on future pr price earnings ratios. I, I don't give a crap about future price, uh, future profit projections for companies. Does that factor in their stock buybacks? and wasting that money? Uh, what kind of goofy little side items do they have on, on line item gimmicks for adjustments to get away from their standard profit and standard costs and standard income, the pro forma accounting? It's becoming ridiculous. I, I like to look at uh, statistics that good, competent financial analysts come out with like, what did that company say a year ago for their forward earnings, and what were the actual earnings, and how much was it lower? Because that's how much they lie by to maintain their future price-earnings ratio. Valuation of stocks has been based on future price-earnings ratio for the longest time. Well, here's the new wrinkle. For the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years, one of the biggest stock valuation factors has been the Fed valuation model, which basically says you take your interest rate, you invert it, and then you work off that to come up with a, a standardized kind of price earnings ratio for the entire market. Well, they didn't put an asterisk next to the Fed valuation model to account for QE. Hypermonetary hyper <laughs> hyper inflation unsterilized, shoved into bond purchases to keep the interest rate down. Well, that just means that the stocks are going to be higher than they should be. We have a recession. Why are stocks high at all? Why aren't stocks 80% lower to factor in the ongoing, vicious, endless recession? Because we have falsified economic statistics because we have QE buying stocks, because we have companies doing stock buybacks, and because the U.S. government has decided a long time ago that there's something called a wealth effect. If people have big stock accounts, big pension 401ks, they're going to tend to spend more and keep the economy sustained. So let's keep those mutual funds elevated, keep those stock indexes elevated, and the public will not react to a vicious recession. They might be unemployed a lot, but that's okay. It's okay. Meanwhile, the United States is marching, oh gosh, lockstep into the third world. Now, regarding the stock markets, it, what's really interesting right now, what's happening is just the volatility is crazy. The VIX, the volatility index, is at its highest point in the last seven years. It, you have to go back to 2011 to where you see a point where it was this high. What do you? What is your perspective on how volatile, not just that it's crashing right now, but how volatile the stock market is? I mean, as we've been having this conversation, I've just been looking at the chart of the Dow. It was down today, you know, um, at 9.30 when we started, about 280 points or so, almost 300 points, and now it's up 150 points about. What is your perspective on the wild swings we're seeing in the market? Are your followers familiar with the Exchange Stabilization Fund from the Department of Treasury? Somewhat, yes, but I guess for our new viewers, if you could explain a little bit about that, that would be great. Okay. The exchange oh, and by the way, it's up 350 points right now, the Dow. It went from down 280 to 350 in the last, within the last 25 minutes. <laughs> I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but golly, I don't give a shit. <laughs> yep. I mean, let me repeat that. I don't give a shit. 
about the stock market indexes. The fact that they're moving wildly only proves that the Department of Treasury and the Fed and major brokerage houses are working overtime to prevent the perception of a disaster and a repeat 10 years later after the Lehman Brothers crashes, 2008 crashes from the stock market. They were brutal, they were ugly, they were penetrating, and they were sustained. The Exchange Stabilization Fund is one of the largest hidden funds in the history of mankind. It's run by the Department of Treasury. It has its fingers in the stock market, the bond market, the currency market, the LIBOR market, foreign major indexes, foreign major currencies, foreign major sovereign bonds. It is the biggest control mechanism to rig financial markets in the history of mankind. It is responsible for managing the interest rate swaps, which fabricate bond demand in the face of absent foreign buyers of U.S. Treasuries. Combine the interest rate swaps run by the ESF, Exchange Stabilization Fund, ESF. Combine that with the Fed doing actual unsterilized bond purchases, and you've got the makings of a completely falsified bond market, completely corrupted bond market, where there are very few buyers, and there's a lot of, like, say, a trillion dollars a year of, of U.S. government debt to finance. If you take away the ESF and the Fed, take away the, uh, you know, the financial market rigging with interest rate swaps, take away the Fed's bond purchases, <clears throat> the U.S. Treasury bond yield for the long term should be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. That sounds like a really dumb thing to say, doesn't it? That's how responsible the QE and ESF factors are. The interest rate swap. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, for, before I give the example, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a size. The ESF run by the U.S. Department of Treasury is probably valued somewhere between four and eight trillion dollars. It's a slush fund. I wouldn't be surprised if narcotics money is, is in, infused in there. It's used to leverage bond purchases with the interest rate swap derivative. The, this is totally fabricated demand for bonds. <clears throat> I firmly believe that in 73 and 4 and 5, when the uh, Arab petrodollar uh, surplus agreements uh, were put in place. I firmly believe part of the deal, you know, in, in addition to having the Saudis lead OPEC into only accepting dollars for oil and recycling their oil surplus dollars in treasuries and U.S., you know, military weapon purchases, in addition, there was a hidden portion to that deal, <clears throat> and that was that the Saudis would gradually contribute to the Fed, uh, to the U.S. government's Department of Treasury Exchange Stabilization Fund. And I believe that the agreement for the Saudis was something on the order of three to five trillion dollars to be recycled into the ESF fund, maybe with an agreement that they'd never see it again. There's, there's evidence of this secret accumulation in the form of the tick report. Until a year or two ago, it was one line item, OPEC nations, OPEC oil producing nations. Um, and they had one line item for the tick report. The Saudis were never a separate item. And it was always a decent sized number. But I always ask the question, 
But wait a minute. These are the big oil producers of the world. The Saudis alone have multi-billion dollar surpluses every month. How is it that after 30 months, uh, 30 years, why after 30 years do the Saudis have so little uh, petrol reserves, Forex reserves from petrol sales? And you hear some lies like, oh, gosh, they had, you know, a big welfare state and they buy a lot of weapons and they have bills. No, 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 no. No, they, they've got some. They had something like over 30, 35 years. They had something like six to ten trillion dollars in surpluses. Where did it all go? I think a big portion of it went to the ESF fund as the core. I mean, we guaranteed the Saudis ridiculous wealth. We guaranteed them protection, and they guaranteed us oil sales <clears throat> within OPEC that would be dollar exclusive. And in return, we required them to slowly fill up the ESF with three trillion to five trillion that they will never see again. Okay, let me give you an example of the interest rate swap route I promised it a few minutes ago. Uh, back in 2010 and 11, there was a, an event that occurred in the bond market. We were told that there was a big flight to safety, a safe haven was found in treasury bonds post Lehman. This was after 09, when we put in the 0% policy. So there was a, a multi-month period where the treasury bonds went in their 10-year yield from about 2.5% down to about 1.4%. It was a full percent drop in the treasury bond yield on the 10 year, the TNX. And we were told it was a big flight to safety. Well, then Rob Kirby came out a couple months later and said, well, take a look at the OCC report, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And it shows Morgan Stanley added on $9 trillion worth of interest rate derivatives. Well, there it is. There was no flight to safety. It was a manufactured bond rally in U.S. Treasuries pushed by interest rate swaps managed by the dirty office of Morgan Stanley. They were the designated bond dirty office. OK, this is all evident for those people who choose to investigate rather than the mindless fools who say, I'm, I'm going to buy some more stocks. Everything's going up. Bond yields are going down. This is great. Okay, that's your moron. Now you got a correction. The Fed decided after six years, I, I love repeating this, uh, Elijah. In 2011, I said, we're going to go to QE just like Japan. They're going to lie and say that it's for six to 10 months. It will be permanent. How did that forecast work out? What's well, correct? They lied. Just like in 2008, when I said after Lehman, we're going to be moving down to 0%. A few months later, we did. And they told us, well, it'll just be for six to 10 months. I said, no, they're lying. It'll be permanent. How did that forecast work out? Okay, we're still at near zero. We're still at QE. And they got an unspeakable, unspeakable amount of hidden support for derivatives that they don't count. If they say they're doing 40 billion a month or 70 billion a month in QE, they're lying by a couple of trillion because that's what they're shoving in to the interest rate swaps. That's what they're shoving into the other dollar swap facilities, other different things that are fortifying something that's been dismantled in the last couple of years, three years, and that is the petrodollar complex. Things are really breaking fast, and we're, we're seeing a dismantling. The, the, this is justified. 
We need to bring this thing back to normalcy. I, I love hearing I love hearing the Fed saying, "Well, we're going to try to bring about normalcy in rates." Oh, really? You mean like six <laughs> percent? They're, they're going to have a hard time just seeing the long-term bond yields trip the three percent wire. Gosh, I remember bond yields. Does anybody remember early two thousand, the year two thousand? Bond yields are at 6.5%. Does anybody remember that? We're in a much, much worse fundamental situation with trade deficits, federal government deficits, tax revenue, economic performance. We deserve to be much, much higher than 6.5% that we had in the early months of the year 2000. Now, regarding what the Fed will do, what is your perspective on how Jerome Powell, now the new Fed chairman, just sworn in yesterday? Do you think having a different Fed chairman will change anything? It will allow them to preside over the disaster more easily because the architects of the disaster are out of the room. Okay, take a look at uh, Greenspan. He left a little bit early so that he wouldn't be on the job during, during the subprime bond market crash and the resulting layman ruin, the insolvent Wall Street situation, the stolen 700 billion TARP funds. No, that was during Bernanke's watch. He was more than happy to sit, sit at the chair and say, well, you know, we got some problems uh, from the past Fed regime. So Bernanke decided, I'm getting out early. Well, maybe he didn't get out early. I don't think he did get out early. He, he, he left. He wanted that speaker tour, high fee, income. I mean, professors at Princeton make good money, but nothing like the speaker fees from former Fed chairman. And, and Janet Yellen is was on the watch during continual QE to infinity. <laughs> I love that phrase. There's only one country that has the honesty to call it QE to infinity, and that's Japan. And it's a funny little side story. I love telling it. Uh, Dateline, September 2014. Uh, the United States government announced that they were going to confiscate <clears throat> steel, the $1.2 trillion government pension fund from the government of Japan. Japan can't stop it because they're a vassal slave state with an occupying U.S. military force in their country. At the same time, the U.S., um, Oh, I don't know whether, I guess it's the NSA or the Langley folks, but they've been using a, a Korean mafia to enforce U.S. government monetary policy on the Bank of Japan for the last 25 years. If you think I'm making it up, you're full of crap. So the Japanese had no alternative except to go to QE to infinity in order to replenish <laughs> in order to replenish the $1.2 trillion U.S. government stole from the Japanese government pension funds. <laughs> and, they, and the Japanese were, were kind of happy to do it because that would bring down their Japanese yen currency and make them more competitive versus China on the export trade. Oh, my gosh. The VIX. The VIX is an interesting little concept. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but when the VIX is low, it means there's very little fear in the market. It means that there's very little volatility. Everything's kind of smooth. And everything's going up nice and easy. Okay, take a look at the VIX and you'll see that up to about two months ago, the VIX was dead asleep low. And <clears throat> while the stock market was going up with the Dow Jones and the S&P indexes rising, 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 during this vicious recession, QE 
And the Fed was buying stocks using the Wall Street banks. You had the Exchange Monetization Fund, I'm sorry, the Exchange Stabilization Fund. They're surely in there buying leveraged S&P futures contracts, pushing things up. And the companies are doing their duty by diverting investment funds in their businesses to buy stock buy to make stock buybacks. But during all this, I don't know why Janet Yellen admitted it. But in her final month, she admitted that the Fed was not only buying stocks, but they were buying crude oil and investing in the VIX. Why would they buy the VIX? To keep it down. It's like putting ice on the thermometer before you shove it into the, the dying patient's mouth who's got a rabid fever. Okay, take that out, put some more ice on it. Take that out, put some more ice on it. Yeah, there's no fever there. Okay, it's an old trick. Now, if you think VIX is the first time they've done such a heretical thing as alter a market indicator, you're wrong. <clears throat> Bernanke for the last, oh, I don't know, I think Bernanke started buying the tips, uh, bonds, uh, after a couple of years into his six-year tenure, and Janet Yellen continued it. It's a Treasury Investment Protection Security. It's supposed to be the Treasury's uh, actual inflation-adjusted bond. But when you alter it by purchasing it, with funny money, you're again removing an indicator that can give you a little bit more information about price inflation from a, from a pure bond market perspective. There is no pure bond market. So they've been messing with the tips, they're messing with the VIX. And if you look closely at some of the Janet Yellen comments in her final months, that was pure fear. You got a lot of international critiques uh, against the Fed in the form of a couple of different messages. Uh, your move toward normalcy will be very difficult. Uh, the benefits of several years of QE are near nowhere. There's no economic uh, revitalization. Uh, we have distortions in the market, and we're not really sure what QE bought us in the form of benefits after six full years. I've been maintaining a very simple point. Two sides. QE avoided big bank failures, a mass of them, because they were all insolvent. Now, you add illiquidity to insolvency, and you get bank failures. Well, their insolvency was fixed by QE and offering them easy money bond carry trade. Invest at zero. I mean, sorry, borrow at zero, invest in the long-term bond, make the difference, pull down the long-term bond yield, put in leverage with the futures, make 20, 30 to 1 leverage on that profit, Revitalize your, your balance sheets with bond carry trade profits, and uh, all will be well because the Fed is going to guarantee liquidity. So these insolvent structures never suffered from illiquidity, and they benefited from this hyper liquidity of QE by putting on their bond carry trades. So now the banks appear to be better off, but you know, if you take away their 10 or 15 percent VIG for narcotics money laundering, they'd be in a lot worse shape. And it's true of all the Wall Street banks. The biggest violators are Citigroup and Bank of America. Bank of America is called, in the parlance of the, the big boys, Papa Bush's slush fund bank for narcotics trafficking. It's so bad that when they have an overnight problem uh, of bank reserves, they sometimes put in a 10 kilo package of heroin, overnight reserves. <clears throat>
U.S. banking system, U.S. financial structure is all broken, corrupt, and beyond remedy. So now we have another crisis. In 2008, we didn't fix anything, Elijah. We just lashed together the big banks with derivatives and figured that no, no one bank will fail. The risk now is to the entire group of banks. That's where we are now, a risk to the entire group of banks, the entire U.S. government debt structure. Before long, we're going to be talking about debt restructure for the U.S. government debt. Debt restructure is a constructive form of default. I've been saying ever since Lehman, we're going to have this long period where we do extraordinarily weird things, heretical things, corrupt things, and wage war to defend the dollar. And finally, we're going to have a U.S. government debt default. It's coming. It's a long time coming. And I love the morons who say, oh, Jim, you're so wrong. You, you've been wrong so many years in a row. No, no, we're just approaching a correct forecast. So are we having fun watching the stock market go down? Only for those who have shorts put in place. I talked last night with a buddy of mine here in Costa Rica. Hadn't seen him in a good year or more. A nice guy. A guy from the Pacific Northwest. A very smart guy. He's a stacker of silver and gold. But he said, you know, Jim, in the last few months I've been – you know, gradually putting in some leveraged S&P shorts. I got most of it in a standard short, but I got some in a 2X short. It started to pay off in a big way. So some people are enjoying what's happening. They're the smart ones. They're not the fools in the crowd who chase the next asset bubble without plugging in their brain stem. All right. Now, moving to the biggest event happening right now, we've talked about it before, but I'd like for you to give us an update on it. The global rejection of the dollar. You talked about earlier in this interview how this is related to why the stock market is falling. Oh, it sure is. Um, <clears throat> there was a statistic that got coined. Uh, you know, it, it began. Uh, I started seeing it. Uh, Back in 2015 and 16, uh, it was last 12 months running total of foreign treasury bond sales. And it, it made headlines. And bear in mind that this is during QE. You know, QE is the hyper monetized, I'm sorry, hyper monetary bond inflation. Um, where they don't, okay, it's really important to understand QE, it's unsterilized. There have been stimulus packages decades ago where the Fed would drain, say, two trillion over the course of several months from the banking system while adding in two trillion or one trillion or 500 billion. But what they added in, they drained elsewhere. But if you don't drain anything and you just shove it in like Zimbabwe, it's called unsterilized. Okay. We have had six years of unsterilized bond monetization. We're taking the U.S. government debt. We're realizing that there are very few foreign buyers of treasury bonds. So we ramp up the ESF at the Department of Treasury. We manufacture based on the feeder of zero interest rate policy. This is very important. When you remove the 0% feeder off the interest rate swap derivative, you remove your free price tag on creating fabricated, falsified bond demand. That's what they're monkeying with now with rate hikes. They've got to make, make a rate hike and take it away behind the scenes so they don't ruin the feeder system for the interest rate swaps. Foreigners are watching this. Foreigners are saying, 
We've got X billion sitting in our banking system reserves, and the Fed and the U.S. government are engaged in unsterilized hypermonetary inflation. We can't stand for this. So they're, they were selling their treasury bonds. We were undermining for years and years, and we still are, the foreign banking system structure in reserves by printing money to cover the U.S. government debt. Foreigners are now beginning to say, you need your own dollar so you can destroy it because you're not gonna, we're not gonna permit you to destroy the treasury bonds sitting in our banking reserves. So the foreign governments and central banks began to dump treasury bonds to such an extent that the last 12 months, you know, you get a new month, so you drop the 13th and you bring on the new, so you're dealing with still 12 months, add them up, and that's your running total, last 12 months of treasury bond dumping by foreign entities. During 2015, 2016, it was steadily 300 to 400 billion dollars a year. It got over 400 billion dollars a year. The running last 12 months. It's called a moving average in statistics, but they like calling it last 12 months because uh, people not familiar with statistical parlance can understand what last 12 months is more than a running moving average. Moving average, what's that? <clears throat> um, so foreigners began dumping. Now, add an another year or two and you get the Eurasian trade zone, the Chinese, the Russian, their holy grail energy deal, $200 billion 20-year project, including pipeline construction. By the way, the pipeline connecting China with Russia is now complete. So they're buying and selling oil outside the dollar. Now you got one belt, one road, and it's multi-trillion dollar projects for which the United States is not in the room, nor is any of its corporations in the room. Multi-trillion dollar, one belt, one road, or belt and road initiative. You got 30, 40, 50 different countries as signatories, participants. I call it the cornucopia giant conference table for setting up, carrying out, and executing giant projects in the multi-billion dollar price range. The United States is not included. None of them are in the dollar. So you've got all these different platforms. Now you have the Chinese uh, interbank payment system. It's also called the cross-border interbank payment system. It's a competitor to SWIFT. It's going to be for RMB settlement, RMB transactions bank to bank. Has an advantage. It's not two days. It's more like two hours. It's not with the... Uh, Oh, I don't know, half a percent, third of a percent. It's much, much lower, tenth of a percent. So it's quicker, cheaper, without government interference in the form of U.S. government sanctions. So Iran's all over that, like rice, white on rice. I don't think they eat much rice in Iran, but who cares? Um, the Eastern nations have a rather substantial amount of momentum in non-dollar platforms. Also, there's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's working closely with the One Belt, One Road. It's the former Soviet republics. It's Russia. <clears throat> it's China. And a growing cast of Southeast Asian nations. So you have all these non-dollar platforms. You've got two, three years of dollar dumping. You got recognition of the QE as being hypermonetary inflation, which is corrosive to banking systems like in South Korea or, or Norway. Um, and it's just starting to eat away at the foundation of the Treasury bond. Now, they can come up with more and more. ESF participation to fabricate bond demand. I guarantee you they are. But remember a primary principle of Ponzi. Ponzi scheme requires that an accelerated amount of money 
is required to sustain it in place as time passes. <clears throat> That's what broke the Madoff Ponzi. He needed an increasing amount of money to maintain the stability, and he didn't have it. So he had to fold, and he's in prison. Or is it his double? I, I don't know. Hey, silly me. What a question. Okay, so you've got dollar rejection. The biggest event on the horizon is China winning the right to buy Saudi oil and pay in RMB terms, their currency, the yuan, yuan, yuan. That's funny. I got some Chinese clients, not many, but a, a couple of actually uh, American uh, U.S. clients who are Chinese background. And they say, Jim, the pronunciation is yuan. Okay. A lot of Americans call it the yuan. I prefer just calling it the RMB because they don't struggle with that. I mean, I don't like the names of the major Asian currencies. You got the Chinese yen, Korean yuan, and the Chinese yuan. Yen, yuan, yuan. Sorry, I don't like those names. I, it's not a requirement for me to like them, but I do have the option of just going with Chinese RMB. Okay, so you've got all these RMB platforms, and now the Chinese are trying to do something very clever. I called this way back, like five months ago. The Chinese are going to try to use the Aramco investment as leverage with the Saudis in order to win the right to buy Saudi oil and pay in RMB. This is a major, major event coming. And the Saudis will suffer Langley terrorism in their country with bombings of urban places and assassination of princes if they agree to allow RMB oil sales with China. That's a very ugly statement to make but, oh, it's got precedent. Okay, the other big event, one of the biggest events in a generation, was the launching of two different Shanghai contracts, futures contracts. The oil gold and then the RMB oil. Put them all together and you get a triangle in Shanghai of RMB oil gold. That is the basis for fracturing and killing the petrodollar. Countries like Iran are going to be using this for petro purchases by China. They're going to be paying in RMB and they're setting up the price hedging with the Shanghai RMB oil gold triangle. You know, just a quick one minute on hedging. <clears throat> If the Chinese arrange for a purchase like right now uh, for, for a May or June shipment of oil from Iran, they're going to want to have protection on what the price is and, and how the RMB is trading with respect to the dollar. So you've got all these different factors in movement to make the transaction unstable from the perspective of the buyer in China and the seller in Iran. So they use price hedging on the June contract for oil in RMB terms. It costs them maybe a couple percent on the transaction, but it eliminates the entire volatility price swings that could ruin the whole deal if a big, big price move occurs. So they hedge. Okay, <clears throat> this is the device, this triangle in Shanghai is going to undermine from an entire Eastern Hemisphere perspective, the petrodollar. The US dollar will not rule the roost in oil sales for Asia, period. They've got a device now. And, and it's coming online, I don't even care whether it's after the Chinese New Year or another month, or another three months. It's coming online. They're getting things set up. They're doing the refining. They're doing the calibration. They're doing the connections. It's got to connect with six or seven different markets. I have indication without definite, without definitive confirmation. I have 
indication that the voice is involved in stress testing of certain features, certain factors, certain aspects of this RMB oil gold triangle connecting with various markets. It's not simple. And this has been a, a, like a British and American expertise for a long time, but we've corrupted it. The Chinese are trying to catch up, make their connectivity, make this work. But the big event is China investing in Aramco and winning the right to buy Saudi oil and pay an RMB. Because once it happens, watch Korea and Japan try to do the same. Once that happens, look for the other Arab competitors to Saudi doing the same. And some already are. Qatar is already selling oil and gas to China and taking RMB payment receipts. So it's working on both sides, the buyer and the seller. It's a huge event. And let me just say as a little asterisk footnote that Aramco is worth approximately 20% of what they think it is because the Saudis are running out of oil. There are consequences to being the number one oil producer for four decades. It's called depletion. They're denying depletion and they're big fat liars. It's the motive for the Yemen war. Yemen is located south of Saudi on the same Arabian Peninsula, same geology, same oil and gas, untapped. So they're trying to raid their neighbor genocide, kill them off, steal their oil and gas, get the U.S. support, and all the Western press networks will not report it. There are very few stories. Occasionally, London will leak a story to the effect that Yemen is loaded with untapped oil and gas reserves, deposits. Saudi wants it. Why do they want it? Because they got depletion. The Gawar, I remember when I moved here in Costa Rica in 07, I remember I have a, a colleague, a really nice guy, he, he tipped me off to the oil drama, which was a website. I don't think it's active anymore, but he said, read this story, Jim, and you'll understand the Saudi problem. It was about the water cut for the Gawar giant elephant field. It, it had moved over 90% in the water cut, which means they shove in so much water into the into the tapped well, like after decades. They shove in water so it doesn't have air. And you don't have, you know, land, what do you call them, uh, implosion of, of, oh God, there's a word for it, sinkhole. You don't have sinkholes all over Saudi Arabia. Uh, so... <clears throat> They shoved in water for decades, and now when they're pumping out oil, it's turning out that they're getting mostly water. It was over 90% water. Well, now it's a 98 to 99% water cut for Gawar. It's not their only oil field, but their other elephant oil fields are suffering the same fate of water cut over 90%. They're having to rely on replacing two or three giant elephant oil fields. Gawar is the biggest in human history. They're having to replace their huge oil fields with numerous smaller oil fields that don't produce a lot, but together they produce a substantial amount and the Saudis can continue in production. But they lie about their reserve capacity. They lie about their reserve deposit total volume. And here's a sick irony. Many of their smaller oil fields in Saudi Arabia are on the border where Shiites control it. And on the south, the Yemenis, the Yeme Yemeni, the Yemeni uh, militias are raiding and if not capturing, interfering with the smaller southern Saudi Arabian oil fields. <laughs> it's vengeance. Oh, I tell you, I am not a big fan of Saudi Arabia, never have. Now, they're, they're going to suffer a simultaneous fate with the dollar. While they cannot retrieve 
their three trillion or five trillion in the Department of Treasury Exchange Stabilization Fund, while at the same time, the US and the British fabricated these phony charges for UBS and Credit Suisse in Switzerland so that the US government could take control of the Swiss banking system, take control of their bullion banks and steal Arab gold. That's what UBS and Credit Suisse prosecution was all about. Gain access to the bullion banks and steal Arab gold. Well, the Saudis were onto it. And they moved their, their gold, and now, ironically, it's a lot of it is sitting at Deutsche Bank, which is, has its own problems. So the global rejection of the dollar is very real. It's picking up pace. And let me, let me describe quickly here, uh, Elijah, what I believe that we're moving toward right now. It, I call it the dual universe. Uh, the United States is not going to declare war against all the advocates of the RMB for trade and banking because there are too many nations. <clears throat> the United States has to engage in some tolerance. And I think what's coming is a smaller RMB universe for trade payments and banking reserves and a larger dollar universe, the dual universe of the dollar versus RMB. The U.S. is going to have its little quiet war with the RMB, trade friction, you know, obstruction, sanctions, and, uh, you know, whip up the storm in the south trying to see what a stupid stupid story that is but you know it, it's a it's a pressure point uh, the dual universe is going to become a reality where the united states military is not going to be dispatched to every country that wants to move toward rmb trade payments and rmb uh banking reserves there's not enough U.S. military to go around. And besides, here's my joke. If the U.S. insists on sanctioning all nations that want to move toward the RMB, they're eventually going to have to sanction two-thirds of the global community of nations. They're not going to do that. So the more constructive approach is to allow the dual universe, allow the RMB to have less than 2% of trade payments in global commerce, while the US dollar has 60 something, like 62, 63, 65, tolerate the RMB, which is in its infancy for global trade, and uh, just poo poo it, say it'll never amount to anything when they're dead wrong. Dead wrong. Dead wrong. It's going to grow, 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 grow. Already you're having. Uh, the uh, Bundesbank in Germany shed dollars, shed treasury bonds, and buy RMB to align with the IMF proportions, the weights for the SDR, special deposit, special D rights, special depository rights. I can't remember what special the drawing. drawing rights, right? Special drawing rights. Thanks. Um, watch countries like Germany with their Bundesbank sell a little bit more treasury bonds than they should because they're going to be adding gold to their reserves. They're going to add RMB bonds, but there aren't a lot of Chinese government bonds out there. The U.S. has a real big advantage from its $20 trillion in debt. Half of it is floating in treasury bonds. There's never a shortage of treasury bonds. But now, sadly, ironically, and, and you know, Incredibly, in the last three years, there's a real shortage of buyers. So that's why we have QE. That's why we have the interest rate swaps moving in to create fabricated demand. That's why we have 0% to provide the cost-free feeder system on the bond derivatives. It, it's all coming apart. I, I'm not going to say that this crisis with uh, the stock market is going to erupt into a, uh, a gigantic crisis that uh, will overwhelm and overshadow the layman, but it could. If it doesn't happen this round, it will the next or the following round. They're gonna have to re rely on Herculean efforts to prevent 
a, a gigantic crisis here. The last time we had something like this was 1987. I'm talking about bonds declining, rising interest rates. I'm talking about stocks declining, and I'm talking about the dollar declining. The U.S. government has actually gone on record. It's not a stupid thing to say. They want a lower dollar to make our export trade more competitive. But what they have not really done their homework on is how that's going to affect both the treasury bond and the stock market. Right now you've got, I call it the fuse. I wrote a public article a couple weeks ago uh, where it referred to the treasury bond being the fuse that's lit. We're, we're going to move toward 3%, I think over 3% on the 10-year bond yield. They call it the TNX. The TNX is going to go over 3%. I got a target of between 3.4% and 4.0%. Check the public article. You can see the chart. It's a head and shoulders uh, reversal pattern, which is very reliable, with a mini head and shoulders reversal pattern just in the last eight to 10 months. And the mini recent head and shoulders reversal has been completed and reached its target. And that will provide the momentum for the larger, like four or five year, four year head and shoulders pattern to reach its target. But the whole thing has an upward bias. The shoulders and the neckline both have parallel upward tilts. So you've got a massively dangerous bear pattern for bonds displayed in a rising bond yield pattern. Rising bond yield is just a curse for the, bond, for the stock market. And if the Fed is tightening, removing their bond purchases, they might also remove their stock purchases. Now you bring in the Fed valuation model, it says, well, rising bond yields dictate lower stock indexes. Now factor in how companies might not want to continue with their stock purchases because they're falling. Why would a company want to buy a falling stock? To put it on its books and have a loss immediately in one month and two months? No, they don't do that. They do that in a rising stock market. Well, now they're going to not only sell, they're not only going to pull back from doing stock buybacks. They're going to sell some of their recent purchases so they don't become big losses on their balance sheet. They should have invested in their own companies, but they followed the Fed lead. They followed the heresy. The global dollar rejection is going to be one of the biggest stories of this generation. The big events are going to be the Chinese buying Saudi oil and RMB, the Chinese oil gold RMB contracts that undermine the petrodollar and the advancement of the Eurasian trade, trade zone using the Belt and Road initiatives. The U.S. stock market is nothing but a Ponzi. The U.S. Treasury bond market is nothing but a Ponzi. You must look at what supports the rising bonds and the rising stocks. It's QE and stock buybacks. It's interest rate swaps, the derivatives. It's all going to come apart. I've been saying now for about three or four years, three, about three years, look for a, a repeat event from the subprime mortgage bonds, except the subprime this time is U.S. Treasuries. We're not going to get a repeat of Lehman. We're going to get something much bigger. I call it the systemic Lehman event. You're going to see sovereign bonds default, and you're going to see entire national system, banking systems enter failure. That's going to be the legacy aftermath of the global dollar rejection. And you know what's going to be the death blow to the dollar? It's going to be... The Chinese RMB becoming gold-backed. 
It's going to be the Chinese adopting the gold trade note atop their triangle of RMB gold oil. The gold trade note is going to be gradually integrated into Chinese trade payments. They might win the right to buy Saudi oil with RMB currency payments, but soon after, watch them integrate the gold trade note for Arab oil purchases. That's like a poison arrow in the chest of the king dollar. These are not pleasant events unfolding. We've had absolutely no justification for the last 100% move in the stock market in the United States. Vicious recession, declining earnings, unemployment rising, inflation pretty steady until the oil price got cut in half. It's in, Price inflation in the United States is, is still not under 4 or 5%. <clears throat> So they're still lying on GDP, still lying on jobless rate, still lying on uh, price inflation. The big three, they all work together to maintain the lie of a sluggish recovery. There is no sluggish recovery. So the last 100%, I mean, we're talking about the last 10,000 points for the Dow, were built upon a lie and built upon false machinery, market rigging machinery. The Fed has no business buying stocks. Companies have no business buying back their own stocks. And the interest rate swap machinery should not be used so extensively to support the U.S. Treasury bond complex. The Treasuries really need to be above 10% like Greece because our fundamentals are worse than Greece. And here's the ir irony that comes when the U.S. finally launches its new dollar. <clears throat> Pardon me. It might not be the end of this year. It might not be before the year 2020. I don't know. I don't care. But it's written in stone that it's coming because the U.S. is going to lose its global currency reserve status. And what I think is going to happen, it's going to remain the Western currency reserve status. The U.S. dollar is going to keep its exceptional privileged status, but only in the West. And by doing that, the entire Western economy and entire Western financial structure is going to be put at risk because they refuse to follow the lead of the East with the gold standard installation. So when the U.S. decides we we're up against the wall. We've we got to do this. We've got to create a new dollar, it's what I call the shice dollar. Its interest rate <laughs> will approach 10%, while its annual devaluation will approach, say, 20 to 30%. That's what's coming down the line for the United States, for all the financial abuse, war, fraud, you name it. Third world status. We have third world fundamentals. Last year we had 550 billion in trade deficit. We're on track for over 600 this year. The last two or three years we've had trillion dollar deficits for the federal government. It's on track for over 1.2, maybe over 1.3 uh, trillion this year. We these are ugly times, Elijah. The, we we're, we're seeing a return to reality begin. This is very early in the correction. People, Many people on Wall Street are saying, okay, the worst we've seen. Now, this is just the beginning. They might stabilize it and win a rally for the next six weeks. But how will they do that? Well, more interest rate swap derivatives, bring down the Treasury TNX to maybe something more manageable like 2.5%, keep it away from the 3.0% target. That's, oh, that's a curse. If it touches 3.0%, it's going to cause a lot of problems. How else could they do that? Well, the Fed goes in there and buys stocks. The Fed shoves free money at Wall Street, and they say, 
They have an agreement to buy stocks, buy the S&P index, buy the S&P leveraged futures. It, it's easy to bring about a recovery, but they're losing control because Ponzi dictates an accelerated amount of money is required to main, maintain the stability. It gets increasingly difficult. These are humans operating machinery that's designed by humans. Pretty soon, they're going to need a second interest rate swap derivative machinery room. They don't have a second. They're just amplifying the current one. I remember the first Fed hike, and uh, I remember saying, well, gosh, watch them do a quarter percent hike, but watch them remove it behind the scenes. And I found out how they did that. They did a reverse repo. Uh, they cut the reverse repo rate, which meant that Wall Street banks could trade in their cash to the Fed and buy treasury bonds and, and run up the leverage to over 100 to 1. In other words, enlist the help of Wall Street banks by taking their cash and letting them leverage up their treasury purchases to 100 to 1. In other words, 1% capital to buy a big stack of treasury bonds. So who's buying the treasury bonds? Interest rate swap derivatives plus Wall Street on leverage. They increase the leverage after they raise the interest rate. One of the most recent interest rate hikes involved, you know, some diddling around with the excess reserves that banks hold at the central bank of the, the Fed. So they got tricks. Every time they do a rate hike, get a trick to maintain the leverage in the system. They're running out of tricks. And I think Janet Yellen got replaced by a nobody for a simple reason. They can't hold it together anymore. Why did Stanley Fisher resign as vice president of the Fed? He's an Israeli uh, outsider, infiltration from Israel again. Why did he leave? I think because they realized they can't hold it together anymore. I don't even know the name of the Fed head. That's how unimportant it is. I, I, I'm, I'm remembering the name Powell. Oh, there Jerome it is. Yeah. Will uh, w Jerome Powell. I have no idea who Jerome Powell is, where he came from, what his resume is, or whether he was even a Fed governor. The real power at the Fed is with the New York Fed and Dudley. He hasn't changed his role in 20 years. All right. Well, Jim Willie, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where they can find you online? Uh, I don't have any final thoughts. I, I think people need to uh, heed my advice that I've been making for the last several months. Sell your stocks when they're high. Buy your gold and silver when they're low. It's a unique concept. It's not a popular concept. The more moronic, popular concept is fine. Whatever's running up and chase it like a fool. Sell your stocks and buy gold and silver. Wake the hell up! But you can find my work on www.goldenjackass.com. Um, this April will be 14 years, Elijah. It's been a... A real labor of love. It's been fun. It's been exhausting. It's been frustrating. It's been rewarding. Um, things are getting stable with the newsletter. I think nothing like a good crisis. As Rahm Emanuel used to say, never let a good crisis go to waste. So the newsletter business never lets a good crisis go to waste because there's lots and lots of subscriptions coming in. Um, when people get scared, they want to know what's going on. When they're starting to lose money, they want to know, how can I avoid that? How can I invest in something that will do the opposite? So it's goldenjackass.com. Newsletter is called The Hattrick Letter. I made a recent change starting with 2018 to celebrate some mega forecasts that have come true, like the, the non-dollar platforms coming into being, the petrodollar on its uh, – Death March. I won't say death bed because it's still moving. It's going to be a death march. Uh, the Germans uh, defying the Russian sanctions led by Brussels and Washington. Uh, 
the the gold trade note coming into view atop the Shanghai RMB oil and gold contracts that are new. Uh, I celebrate these mega forecasts coming to be by having only one report now. You know, it's a bit long because a lot, still a lot happening, but I, I no longer need to explain my forecast of the dying petrodollar because it's happening. I no longer need to explain the isolation of the dollar and the, the ruin of the nation by the fascists and their fascist business model because it's happening right before our eyes. I no longer have to explain how the Russian sanctions are going to be ignored and most U.S. foreign policy will be ignored, like, say, sanctions. The Europeans, for instance, are not honoring the Iran sanctions that are ordered by the U.S. government in a complete dishonor of the Iran nuclear talks and that agreement that resulted. The Europeans want renewed relations with Iran. They want renewed investment and renewed commerce. They want to end the Washington fascist nonsense. Anyway, the biggest thing Trump needs to do right now, in, in addition to you know, the revelations with the sealed indictments and all that that QAnon talks about, Trump needs to reindustrialize the United States and fulfill his promise during the campaign. We need 20 to 30 new, thousand new businesses a year. We need foreign investment in the United States for businesses. We need to have the export focused. We need to reduce this trade deficit that's going to be over 600 billion. Because unless and until we reduce this trade deficit, the United States can never have a legitimate currency. If we have a gold backed currency, Elijah, right now, the $600 billion in trade deficit would result in 14,000 tons of gold forfeited that might back our new dollar. It would result in 80 strategic petroleum reserves forfeited each year. We need to reduce trade deficit. The financial engineering experiment failed. We've wrecked our country. Trump needs to reindustrialize the United States, bring about free trade zones, amplify the ones that exist in 50 states, and bring about huge incentives like three-year moratorium on property tax, three-year moratorium on income tax, maybe some tax credits in addition for hiring. These are foreign concepts to the United States. We don't know how to rebuild an economy. We've gotten so addicted to financial engineering, financial asset bubbles, that we move from one to the other to the other, and we see them all wrecked, and we're seeing one being wrecked right now. It's got a long way to go before it has any kind of stability and legitimate pricing. We're in a vicious recession that has been between minus three and minus 5% for 10 consecutive years, maybe 11 if you count 2006, maybe 12 if you count 2006 and 7. 12 consecutive recession years. We're in a nasty freaking depression, people. We cannot continue to call inflation growth. So, you know, Buy your gold, buy your silver, make it 80 to 90 percent silver because silver is going to be the big deal. That's where I see the 10 and 20 fold gains coming. Anyway, I cover a lot of stuff in the hat trick letter. I'm going to be covering a little bit less in the side topics that support the mega forecast. I'm going to be supporting the mega forecasts as they're unfolding before our eyes, the death of the dollar, the death march of the petrodollar, the new Eurasian trade zone, all their non-dollar initiatives, uh, the workarounds with the Gazprom pipelines, how Syria will be converted into an actual integrated player into the global community, and the retreat of the U.S. military. We've got to stop the war crimes. Gosh, it's so bad, Elijah, 
that the United States cooperated and allowed Saudis to pay off a bribe to the United Nations to avoid having war criminal charges, war crime charges slapped on Saudi Arabia for Yemen. Anyway, thanks for having me on. I hope people go to goldjackass.com, sign up for the newsletter. We're in exciting times, and it's good to have a, you know, like a program guy.